Before I get into our updates, I want to remind everyone today is Giving Tuesday, a day where those of us who can are asked to support our neighbors and communities. So in a year when so many are hurting, please consider donating to a local charity, your food bank, rescue shelter, or nonprofit to help those in need. Today, along with our weekly modeling, we'll be updating you on our work to increase testing and build up our contact tracing team. And Dr. Levine will share more about what we're seeing on the ground. He'll also talk about an issue with over 200 tests from the Barry area that couldn't be processed, which is an error we're looking into so we can make sure it doesn't happen again. Moving to today's update, Commissioner Pichek's data, which includes how mobility has changed over the last few weeks, is promising news. As you can see, or as you will see, it looks as though uh, there, have, there have been uh, changes in behavior uh, that will hopefully lead to fewer cases than projected. And while uh, cases are still rising, the growth rate is slowing a bit. It's too early, however, uh, to know exactly how many people kept their Thanksgiving get-togethers small and what impact holiday travel will have. But with this initial data and the lower in daily cases we're seeing, I'm feeling cautiously optimistic. I want to thank all those who made sacrifices over the last few weeks. But with that thanks comes another ask to keep it up until we have a little more data on the impact of Thanksgiving. As I've said, it's my hope that if the majority of Vermonters follow the latest guidance, we'll be able to ease some of the restrictions in the not too distant future. I also want you to know part of our strategy to help slow the spread is to go on offense. We're continuing to stand up new testing sites, giving people more ways to get a test, including more areas of the state and more convenient hours for those who are working. This is on top of our expanded surveillance, uh, which uh, where we tested over 9,000 teachers and school staff last week, and we'll now begin testing about 25% of school employees each week on a rotating basis. And we continue to add to our contact tracing capacity as well. To be clear, we're not just taking these actions because of our rising case counts. We've been building up these systems, systems over time so we can go on offense against this virus. As we've said uh, since we started reopening the economy, these are the tools that help us do uh, this safely while we await a vaccine. And we continue uh, to have good news on that front as well. Our teams are ready for their first shipment of vaccine whenever those are distributed by the federal government. I share all of this because even when we face some of the toughest challenges since March, there is reason to be optimistic and there is reason to see light at the end of the tunnel. I was asked last Friday if I was giving false hope, so I want to be clear. We have tough days and months ahead and we're not out of the woods yet, but we are at a point where we can see that light more clearly than we, have through, than we have throughout the pandemic. And we have to keep focused on it so we can get through this dark tunnel as strong as possible. We can't give up when we're finally seeing a way out. So I want to, again, thank Vermonters for their perseverance and their commitment to each other. We can and we'll get through this together. And with that, I'll turn it over to Secretary Smith for an update on our testing and tracing programs. Secretary Smith. Thank you very much, Governor. I want to begin my remarks today by addressing an incident that was reported in the Times Argus last night and began last Friday when 246 COVID tests that were collected at the Barry Auditorium did not arrive at the lab in Massachusetts in a timely, in a timely manner and therefore could not be processed because of the time that had elapsed between collection and lab processing. In addition, a letter went out last night informing individuals who were waiting on these COVID results 
of this incident and asked them to be retested. Compounding the problem was the letter informing them of the incident listed all the available email addresses of everyone who had been tested. This was followed up by another letter apologizing for the error. First off, let me apologize personally for this incident. None of, none of this should have happened. It is not the fault of the individuals who took the test. They were doing the right thing, getting a COVID test. There was an issue with the, the, the delivery, and while the state of Vermont uses an outside company for shipping testing specimens, we must take responsibility for not having a better process in place to confirm when the labs arrive and when they are being processed. The Agency of Human Services and its health department must make sure this never happens again. As Secretary of, the, uh, uh, Secretary of this agency, I take responsibility and my office needs to act. After literally administering tens of thousands of tests to Vermonters, this is the first time that there was a slip up on this important, uh, of this magnitude. Compounding the error was a letter that went out with email addresses impro improperly attached to it. I've asked the health department to immediately get additional testing sites in the area if needed, and those, and those tests of the individuals impacted to be expedited. In addition, I've asked my general counsel at the agency level to investigate what happened with the UPS delivery to the Broad Institute in Massachusetts. Samples arrived at the UPS facility in Somerville, Mass, processing on 11:28 at 6:23 a.m. and sat there, not going out for delivery to Broad until 50 hours later, on 11:30 at 8:41 a.m. As a result, the as a result, the samples were spoiled and could not be tested. In addition, I've asked my general counsel to see what, if any, federal privacy violations may have occurred and what the state must do to rectify any of those violations. Lastly, I've asked the health department to review all testing and reporting procedures and report to my general counsel any changes that need to be placed, uh, to, need to be put in place to quickly inform us of a delay uh, of a delivery to the lab. Additionally, we will be re reviewing all our notification processes to ensure that in the future we avoid sending out letters with information that could identify an individual. We cannot let this mistake happen again. We have done a lot of testing in, in, in Vermont. If you remember, in the spring we had limited testing supplies and therefore we were limited in our ability to test Vermonters. Today, the state has a robust uh, testing system with plenty of supplies on hand. I will discuss our increased capacity momentarily. But most important thing is for testing needs and testing to be, to be trusted by Vermonters. This incident can erode trust, but in addition to an apology, which I again give, Actions need to happen to ensure that this incident isn't repeated. My office will oversee the review of our processes and reform and reforms and breakdowns uh, of anything that we find. As I mentioned just a moment ago, testing has quickly evolved in the state from the days at the outset of the pandemic when there was limited testing to today when we have very both robust uh, testing capabilities. As our capabilities grew last spring, Vermonters became aware of our pop-up sites that were placed strategically for a day or two, often in areas where there was an outbreak, where there was a lack to, of testing, or more surveillance testing was needed. Recently, we not only are keeping the flexibility of pop-ups to respond to specific outbreaks and other needs, but we're also adding to that capacity with permanent on-demand sites located throughout Vermont with day, evening, and weekend hours that are open and available to anyone seven days a week. 
We had initially set a goal to have 14 of these new on-demand testing sites by the end of November, and we have hit that mark. In addition, we'll, we will be have other sites coming online in the coming weeks. These sites are in addition to the pop-up capability, hospital and pharmacy testing locations that already exist. Just to give you an idea of where these 14 location sites are, they're, they're in Bennington, Brattleboro, Stratton Mountain, Newport, Rutland, Berlin, Burlington, Northfield, St. Johnsbury, Fairley, Waterbury, Springfield, Middlebury, and Waitsfield. Providing local, easy, accessible testing to Vermonters is crucial to our success in keeping Vermonters healthy and safe. And we will be uh, adding on to that list in the weeks to come in places like Hardwick and Springfield and Morrisville and Island Pond and coming up even later in Wells River and Richford. It's important that we meet the needs of Vermonters in the area of testing and increase our testing capacity. I would encourage anyone interested in getting tested to visit healthvermont.gov forward slash COVID-19 uh, forward slash testing for more information. There is also uh, space, limited space, for walk-ins at the location. So, but the most important thing and the most efficient way is to get a test is to register online at the website at the health department. Over the, uh, over the last seven days, we've conducted 34,225 tests. This is down from the previous seven-day reporting period that had us conducting 48,158 tests. The 48,000 number, 48,000 number included college testing, which has ended since students are home for an extended period. We anticipate that these new on-demand sites, coupled with outbreak testing and continued surveillance testing in schools, long-term care facilities, and enhanced testing at hospitals, which I'll discuss in a minute, and other locations, we will see approximately 30,000 plus tests a week with everything that comes online. In addition, we are enhancing testing in other ways. We continue our conversations with the Vermont Hospital Association and we'll be working with hospitals in this state to increase testing significantly of their employees on a monthly basis. We should be announcing that next week. Also, we were, are issuing Binex cards, a card, Binex Now cards, rapid antigen tests to those long-term care facilities who have not had access to rapid antigen tests through the direct distribution from the federal government. In addition, we will soon begin offering twice a week PCR testing for employees to any uh, skilled nursing facility that requests it. Since long-term care facilities have been increasing in activity lately, we will begin reporting VDH outbreak data twice a week in long-term care facilities. In addition, we will begin presenting the number of probable cases, symptomatic or exposed people, with those antigen tests that aren't PCR confirmed. Or where EPI has decided that based on interview information, sometimes when people refuse testing, it presumes they are positive. This is being done for two reasons. One, for transparency, especially as the use of antigen tests become more widely used, and two, to be in line with other states. We will begin to report this starting tomorrow, and we will add 120 um, uh, presumptive positive uh, positives that are from the period September 6 until now on the dates in the time period that they were reported. In the areas of contact tracing, as we have discussed at previous press conferences, contact, contact tracing is a critical tool to mitigating and containing the spread of COVID-19. We have worked hard to ensure we are prepared to meet the rise of cases across Vermont 
And as we see case counts continue to increase across the country and the state, we are beginning to uh, add more staff to assist in this effort. We're currently on track to have a total of 100 FTEs or 72 staff per day on the contact tracing team by December 7th. This would mean that the team could contact 216 individuals per day. Additionally, we are looking at opportunities to expand our call center and implementing a text notification to reach Vermonters with initial information. Having, uh, having a quick conversation or text message to Vermonters alerting them to the fact that they have been identified as a close contact will help us get the word out to impacted individuals as quickly as possible. This is not equivalent to our current contact tracing efforts, but it is the first step in reaching out to individuals and alerting them to having been possibly exposed. So a lot going on in contact tracing, a lot going on in testing, and with that update, I'll turn it over to Dr. Levine for further updates. Thank you, Secretary. As you all know, today is the first day of December, the final month of what has been a long year for many of us. You sacrificed so much in the spring, and many of you continue to adapt and adjust your lives to help keep each other safe. I know it's especially hard to do during the holidays when we're used to being together. So to those of you who avoided those traditional gatherings on Thanksgiving and throughout the weekend, I want to personally thank you. Today we're reporting 63 cases and 20 Vermonters hospitalized with COVID. We can't be absolutely certain of that number due to some of the UVM reporting issues that they're having. Our numbers have been trending a bit lower than they were in mid-November, but we still have yet to see the potential impact of cases from Thanksgiving gatherings. Which, if they begin to happen, will start today and for the next week and a half. Unfortunately, we've also seen three more deaths in the past three days, bringing our total to 72. Two of these were women in their 90s, and one was a man in his 70s. Our sympathies go out to their families. As of last evening, our epi teams were following 39 outbreaks in 185 situations. One of these is our first situation related to a Thanksgiving dinner party that was celebrated early, but I can only hope this single event will not be a sign of more to come. As we wait and see if our efforts have made a difference, please remember that the governor's order prohibiting multi-household gatherings is still in place. If we can keep doing our part to prevent further spread of COVID-19, we can weather the current surge in cases. If you did gather, you should quarantine and get tested. It's best to get tested right away and again on day seven or later. As I've said here before, as cases increase, opportunities for transmission increase, sometimes causing situations in facilities we need to investigate, and sometimes leading to outbreaks. Our contact tracers are doing incredibly hard work right now tracking down these cases and even longer list of close contacts. They are dedicated to making sure everyone has the information and recommendations they need for their own health including for testing, quarantine, and isolation. But we are counting on you all to help, to answer the call and provide complete information. It is so critical to keep the logs of all employees, customers, members, and guests, and their contact information required by the Agency of Commerce and Community Development's WorkSafe guidance. And even in your own life, to keep a really good list of who you've been around. Because there may be situations when we can't reach everyone we need to, whether directly or through an organization or facility point of contact. And we may need to notify the larger community 
that they may have been exposed, such as through a news release or other means, to take the public health action quickly. Like we did this past weekend, when sufficient information or cooperation was not forthcoming from a case or from an event that person attended that could have put others at potential risk, that either did not keep the appropriate list of guests or did not care to share our public information with their attendees, communications that we had even drafted for their use. In such cases, we put the public's health and safety first and the need to protect the people they may be in contact with and who deserve to have the information and recommendations for their own health and to have this in a timely fashion. You can help simply by being intentional about what you do. Think about where you're going, who you'll see, and how you're feeling every time you leave the house. I also want to reiterate what the Secretary was saying and preview a change coming to our data reporting. The number of cases of COVID-19 we, we report currently only includes cases confirmed by PCR testing. Starting Wednesday, our case numbers will include probable cases on the dashboard of our website and in other publicly reported data. A case is considered probable if the person has symptoms of COVID-19 and tested positive on an antigen test and has symptoms of COVID-19 or epidemiologic evidence, or if the case has symptoms of COVID-19 and is epidemiologically linked to a confirmed case of COVID-19. For all such probable cases, health department teams take the same public health actions as if a case were confirmed by PCR. This means that contact tracers conduct interviews with probable cases, provide isolation guidance, and their close contacts are notified to quarantine. Reporting probable cases as part of our total cases will more fully capture COVID-19 activity in Vermont at a time when antigen testing is increasing, particularly in places like nursing homes. The impact right now, as you heard, is minimal, about 120 cases that are considered probable will be included in our total cases. In speaking about nursing homes, I did talk Friday about my increasing concerns related to long-term care facilities. My concerns have only become more magnified in the ensuing days. As of yesterday, not only were the three deaths I noted related to such facilities, although one individual passed away in the hospital, but we had seen a total of 165 cases in eight facilities, ranging from skilled nursing facilities to assisted living. Our healthcare facility outbreak prevention and response team shares my view that the virus is entering these facilities as a silent traveler the majority of the time, present in the nasal passages of staff who have yet to develop symptoms and are unknowing vectors. The fact that they are infected at all is testimony to the fact that more virus is present in our communities. Hence our continuing guidance to Vermonters regarding the key ways to prevent the transmission, which of course includes avoiding multiple household gatherings no matter how small they may be. In addition, we're expanding our work with long-term care facilities throughout the state, most of which do not have a lot of new infections to increase the amount of surveillance testing with staff in order to find and isolate these cases early on while they are without symptoms and before infection can spread. Our goal will be to test twice weekly in skilled nursing facilities with PCR testing and to continue to make antigen testing available so that facilities can utilize it as a primary testing strategy when an outbreak has already occurred or when the virus prevalence in a region is high. And we will, of course, ensure that PPE supplies are sufficient to meet needs and protocols for PPE use are being adhered to. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichek. Uh, good morning, everybody. 
So while the country continues to face considerable challenges with COVID-19, uh, today here in Vermont, there is some reason for cautious optimism, as the governor alluded to. First, although weekly regional cases have increased for the 14th week in a row, the rate of new case growth has again slowed. Second, over the past two weeks, our mobility data indicates that Vermonters have decreased their movement, spending more time at home and commuting less often to workplaces, thereby reducing opportunities for the virus to spread. These sacrifices have resulted in not only a slowing of cases here in Vermont, uh, but in fact decreasing from a seven-day high of 105 to 70 cases today, a nearly or an over 30 percent decrease. While these are certainly encouraging signs, we of course must remain vigilant because the risk continues to be significant in communities all across Vermont, with more active cases in Vermont now than at any point during the pandemic. Focusing first on our regional data, cases did increase week over week, with over 92,000 cases reported. However, that rate of growth did slow to under 4%. From October 26th to November 16th, you can see that the week over week growth has continued to slow. Uh, it was growing for three or four weeks at a pretty rapid pace, but it has slowed down more recently, which is of course an encouraging sign. However, we must also remember that the availability and willingness to be tested over the Thanksgiving holiday is likely depressing the confirmed case number, at least to some degree. The updated regional model indicates that we can expect to see the slowdown continue with new cases expected to rise 29% over the next three weeks, which is a decrease from the 45% expected last week. Again, the next few weeks are less certain as we wait to see the impacts of holiday gatherings. Vermont's mobility data is also reason to be optimistic. Over the 10 days following the implementation of the new mandates, there was a 20% reduction in travel to the workplace and a 27% increase in the amount of time that Vermonters are spending at home. Further, Vermont's overall mobility has decreased to where we are now the second least mobile state in the country. For comparison purposes, yesterday Vermont maintained the lowest per capita growth rate in the country, while North Dakota had the highest, a rate that was about 16 times greater than our own. I mentioned Vermont being the second least mobile state. While North Dakota, depicted here on the red dotted line on the chart, is one of the most mobile states and has been for some time. This drives home the point and the importance of limiting our travel and our interactions during a pandemic. Turning to our Vermont numbers, we reported 475 cases this week, a decrease of over 200 from the week before. Things have also seemed to calm down recently in Washington County. It's no longer one of the counties with the highest active case count in the region. Further, during the 10 to 14 days following the new mitigation measures, we have seen clear, a clear slowdown and decrease in our case counts, as mentioned by approximately 30% since the seven day high. This is of course really good news, but with the impacts of holiday travel and holiday gatherings yet to be seen, we need more time over the next week to determine exactly what trajectory we are currently on. Regarding Thanksgiving, we do have two early data points that give us some insight as to what we might expect over the coming weeks. First, regarding overall travel into Vermont, we see that travel was down 52% on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving compared to 2019 and down 55% on Thanksgiving Day. Similarly, Vermonters traveling out of state was a reduction of about 58% this year over the three day period, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, compared to 2019. Further, air travel is down both nationally and locally. Nationally, 60% fewer passengers travel through airports during Thanksgiving week, while here in Burlington, the airport saw a reduction of 77% compared to a year ago. There is still a lot of uncertainty around the Thanksgiving holiday, but it does appear that travel was reduced significantly in Vermont. And to keep our momentum, 
We have to continue to follow the guidelines and continue to be vigilant and careful. Reasons to be vigilant and careful, just to emphasize the point, we'll show on the next couple of slides. In Vermont, over 46% of our cases were reported during the month of November, more than the months of March through September combined. This means that we currently have more active cases in our state than pretty much any time previous during the pandemic. This chart estimates the active number of cases in Vermont, and as you can see, there are considerably more cases today than there were back in the spring. This means we still have an elevated risk of coming into contact with someone who is infectious, and we must be careful and continue to follow the guidance. Finally, turning to our weekly updates on K-12 higher education and long-term care facilities, looking at the K-12 through chart, you'll notice that, Verm that New Hampshire added over 100 new cases this week, uh, while uh, Maine added 25, and here in Vermont, we added 18. Turning to the higher education slide, this will be the last update we provide on higher education this year, uh, since their in-person portion of the fall semester is now complete. Vermont's colleges and universities certainly did a remarkable job keeping their students, their staff, and their communities safe during this very unusual and challenging semester. In total for the fall semester, over 220,000 COVID-19 tests were administered with 238 positives, meaning about 1% of the 21,000 students enrolled in in-person instruction contracted the virus this fall. Congratulations are certainly in order to everyone who made Vermont one of the safest places in the country to attend college this semester. Finally, a brief update regarding cases in long-term care facilities. Since the last update last week, there are two active outbreaks that were added to the chart, bringing the total active number of outbreaks to eight. And there were 65 additional cases reported through these outbreaks, uh, bringing the total of active cases in outbreaks to 166. At this time, I would like to turn it back over to the governor. Thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Uh, we'll now open up to questions. All right, before I start in the queue, I just want to make note that Dr. Levine does have to leave for about an hour in about five minutes. Um, so we'll do our best to answer questions while he's out. I will start in the room with Calvin. So probably a couple questions for Dr. Levine. So previously this summer, um, you'd expressed concern about using antigen tests because of the false positivity rate. I'm wondering why we're choosing to use them now. I'm so glad you asked that question, Calvin. The direction we're going in with antigen tests at the long-term care facilities is number one, when an outbreak has already occurred at a long-term care facility, by definition, it has a higher prevalence of virus than it's ever had before. And you want to be able to make rapid decisions regarding triage of patients and staff and cohorting of them so that uh, infections don't spread. Uh, so a positive test on an antigen test, which is available very quickly, uh, would be um, looked at as a way to immediately implement a change. Second thing is, as you saw on the slide of how active the disease is in Vermont now in general, uh, many of our long-term care facilities will be in regions of the state where the prevalence of virus is much higher than it's ever been. And the likelihood of a positive antigen test being a true positive is much higher in those settings if the person is still symptomatic than it would be at a time of low prevalence when the false positivity rate could, could approach 50%. So we find that there is a definite role for that at this point. And then I guess in terms of um, beginning to report um, presumptive positive um, cases, I'm wondering why we haven't done that as of yet, like why we haven't been including that in our data. And then also, you know, we're going to see more cases included I'm wondering, maybe this is more of a question for the governor, but what sort of um, perception the public might take from that, or what, what kind of impact that might have on the public's perception of our case count? Sure, so um, the, the, the term we're using is not presumptive as much as probable cases as opposed to confirmed with PCR. 
Um, and the amount of antigen testing in the state is fairly low at this point in time. The number of cases that are clinically determined without testing is very low. So we're now well over 4,000 cases that we've recorded in the state, and we'll only be adding 120 cases in the manner we just described. Now, going forward, there will be more, uh, but there won't be uh, leaps and bounds more. So uh, we really haven't been, you know, we're not uncovering a treasure trove of cases that we didn't uh, show anybody before because it's such a very tiny percentage of the total. Uh, but we do feel, based on the fact that many states like us that we fell into a category with uh, had not reported these cases before, that we've all kind of in unison decided that this would be an appropriate maneuver now when the disease is so much more active. And we want to make sure that all tests are looked at equally well and not just require one to have had a PCR or nothing else. This may also be for Dr. Levine or perhaps Secretary Smith. Uh, I know back in the spring there were some instances in long-term care facilities where uh, folks who were not uh, coronavirus positive were moved out of those facilities. I know that happened to Burlington Health and Rehab, uh, where some folks were taken to a, a nearby hospital to be away from that ongoing outbreak. Is that something that's being considered in any of these eight facilities that currently have case counts? Is, is that something that's being considered moving forward? We only did that once, and it was uh, Burlington Health and Rehab, and it didn't really work. Um, we tried to move them to a different facility. I think it was a hotel at the time, and it really didn't work because we found out that sooner or later they became positive, and, and uh, it, it just wasn't a good strategy at, at the time. What we have done now is, is move people directly to the hospital if there is a need to uh, uh, either lighten up the staff load or to uh, take care of this individual is move them to the hospital. So we have been moving patients to the hospital, uh, particularly in some of these outbreaks that have happened. And with the growing number of cases in these long-term care facilities, I know that there's a concern about the impact that could have on uh, staffing there. Is the health department coordinating with say the UVM health network or the other health care providers in the state to be ready to assist them should they need help keeping things staffed? Yeah, it's actually uh, Dale, the Department of Aging and Independent Living, Commissioner Hutt has been uh, on Thanksgiving night, was uh, on the phone uh, dealing um, with uh, with their with a facility, it, what we have found is within the within 24 hours to 48 hours after an outbreak happens, you may lose staff at that point, and so you, you're a little bit um, uh, not as stable as you'd like to be. So getting staff in uh, in that time period is where the critical time period is, and UVM has been very helpful in terms of moving patients and helping us locate various things, and the National Guard has been very helpful in various uh, occasions, as well as um, you know the, the Medical Reserve Corps and other areas that we've, we've had. But where we've found the critical time period is the 24 to 48 hour period. After that, the facility seems to be able to uh, stabilize itself in terms of staffing. Thank you. I just uh, want to go back to Kelvin's question for just a minute. Um, you know, on a couple of different levels. One, um, we want to know about positive cases. I mean, I know it's not a reflection, a, a great reflection on Vermont if we have more positive cases, but the sooner we know about it, uh, the better we can mitigate and prevent the spread. So that's the goal, really, is to identify all the cases we possibly can in whatever manner we can. So uh, I think D uh, Dr. Levine, had, and he's gone now, so he can't clean this up, but I think what he had said earlier with antigen tests uh, that because we didn't have the number of positive cases, the positivity rate wasn't uh, wasn't uh, immense here in Vermont, uh, that it wasn't as accurate. Now, our, unfortunately, our cases are up, uh, so it is more accurate. Um, as well, I think that the, and Commissioner Pichak might be able to, um, to reinforce this, but I believe w what we need to watch is the positivity rate, uh, because that includes the gross number. Like, so we do more testing, uh, the more testing we have, the more cases we might find. But the positivity rate, if, as long as it stays the same, 
uh, all is good um, from my standpoint. Is that correct? Do you want to clean that up at all? Okay. <laughs> All right, and as the governor mentioned, Dr. Levine did leave. He should be back in about an hour. <clears throat> and we do have other folks who can help try to answer uh, the health-related questions. And, and I might add, I'm not trying to complicate things, but if you have a specific question for Dr. Levine, uh, you might want to take a pass uh, and to see if we can get back to you uh, after, after the fact, if that works uh, for you, Rebecca. We can navigate that. All right, we'll start with Ed from the Newport Daily Express. My question is, uh, is uh, you spelled out the different uh, testing sites and uh, the one place you mentioned was Newport, Vermont. Uh, Orleans County and Essex County recently showed a tremendous spike. It was Orleans County being a very rural area of the state and with people who were crossing back and forth to and from New Hampshire for work. Uh, what methodology do you use to not put uh, Essex County um, as a higher priority to set up one of these tests? I know you're going to set up a site company out in the future, um, but it seems that if that's where the action is, you would put a site up there. I, I do believe we have a, a site set up in Island Pond Island at the Pond FQHC, but I'm going to let Secretary Smith answer that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Ed, thank you very much for that. Um, some sites come up faster than the other ones, but on uh, this week we hope to have the Island Pond site up uh, uh, this week. So we are concentrating on Orleans we, and Essex. We understand um, the case counts that are up there. That's why we do have one in Newport and we do have one in Island Pond. We also uh, will be looking at other facilities as we uh, move forward. So you are correct. We're concerned about the case count in those counties, and we're responding by putting permanent seven days a week testing there. Okay, guys, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that it was going to be happening soon and not in a few weeks. Of no, it's going to be happening soon. Saying it'll yeah, it's going to be happening soon. Okay, okay, great. And uh, one other clarification question that came up. Uh, that I was asked about where the uh, eventually snowmobile season setting up. Uh, people who are out of staters who have a secondary home in Vermont, could they take the COVID test, come up and stay in their secondary home and go snowmobiling and have that considered to be self quarantining for you know the appropriate time period? Or are they not allowed to come up until they've gone through the test and the seven day wait? One, once they get into Vermont, um, they have to quarantine uh, 14 days or seven days with a test, regardless of okay. whether they have a second home. Okay. Yeah. Then I just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Good morning, Governor. Thank you for taking the time to answer Barton Chronicle. Okay, we'll move to Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, I may want to loop back around. I do have some questions for Dr. Levine, but maybe Secretary Smith could clarify. Uh, in the letter that Commissioner Levine sent to the 224 medical patients, there was no indication of when Vermont specifically learned about the problem. I know you gave sort of a timetable, and maybe I missed exactly when Vermont learned about it. And I, I guess some of the people who were impacted are wondering why you explained some of the 72-hour delay in notifying them. But, uh, but wondering when did Vermont learn about it and uh, why the delay by Commissioner Levine in yeah, notifying I'll, the patient. I'll let uh, Secretary Smith, uh, I think we're still looking into mm -hmm. that, but it, uh, from my standpoint, I don't believe we knew about it until yesterday because the, the package was sitting in a warehouse in Somerville, Mass. 
until yesterday morning. Um, so we didn't uh, we didn't have any knowledge of that. We thought that it was going through the process and being tested, and we were going to get results uh, yesterday. But Secretary Smith. Yeah, I know. I was looking for the time. I, I assume the 50 hours was a big chunk of that 72 hours delay. But, uh... Yeah, it, the governor's right, Mike. Um, the the package sat in a warehouse for uh, 50 hours or so. Um, whatever I had mentioned previously, it had set it had set in that warehouse in in Somerville, Mass, uh, 50 hours until 50 hours later when it was. Uh, delivered um, you know I became aware of this at 8 o'clock last night um, and so I'm we're still that's why I have my general counsel going through and trying and doing the investigation to find out the timeline and find out what happened here uh, to make sure that it doesn't happen again so they never the health department never told you until two hours after their initial email to the patients that there was a problem I knew I knew at eight o'clock last night by an email um, that we had we had an issue. Okay, they sent it out to the patient. Yeah. Two hours. They didn't bother to notify it. And the other question, maybe you can answer, is and I don't know why you can't, but at least one uh, Washington County resident told that is the kind of darkest article last night. That she was never tested on Friday, but still received Dr. Levine's two emails. How accurate is your record keeping? I mean, how do you know you've actually reached everybody that was tested on Friday? Um, and the other thing, somewhat re related, is you talk about taking responsibility, and I appreciate you accepting, apologizing, and everything. But it does sound like it was you that had the problem. Are you planning to cancel the contract with UPS? What discipline does the health department employee that sent out the emails incorrectly to the individual patients? What is he or she facing? Yeah, Mike, I think it's too early to. Um, I, I think obviously UPS um, is is upsetting here to me at least, and the fact that uh, email addresses went out is upsetting to me. But I think it's too early. Let's let's give the general counsel. Uh, time to dig into this. He's digging. He's starting to dig into it this morning, and can, we'll continue to dig into it today to find out. Um, and if there is, um, if U, UPS it was um, uh, not paying attention here, we, we need to know. And if if something else, if somebody else wasn't paying attention, we need to know. So I, I think it's just too early. Um, for us, I I met with the general counsel this morning before I came into this uh, press conference and, and gave him his task, uh, what he needs to do. And is looking at the state employee who sent that the email out with all these private emails. Are they looking at possible discipline for that employee? Yeah, I think it's too early, but I think what we need to do is look at the whole situation, the timeline figure out what happened here and dissect it and make sure it never happens again. And if there's things that need to be done, we'll do them. Is that employee suspended or still on the job? I, I don't know. I don't even know who the employee is yet, Mike. I, you know, literally we're, we're trying, we tried to work through this um, late into the night and started again early this morning. Thank you very much. I'll wait for Commissioner Erger and we'll be back. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, thank you. This is probably is going to be in the same vein of it's too early to tell, but the state had mentioned in the email where the mistake was where everyone was told what their, their emails were, that there were failures in the system. Uh, have those been identified yet? Any changes that have come in? Is it as simple as someone wasn't didn't put a blind carbon copy on the email? Yeah, I don't have the answer to that. And again, we're just trying to assess the situation. So I think, Eric, it does uh, fall under the category of uh, we're still looking into it, to find out what went wrong so we can prevent it from happening in the future. I mean, I want to offer again my apology uh, as governor uh, to those who had their imp personal information uh, sent out uh, in that manner. And uh, they didn't do anything wrong. They were just trying to get a test done. And uh, I might also offer 
uh, that we want to make sure that you do get tested. And uh, if you can get to a testing site today, identify who you are. And uh, I make a commitment, uh, we haven't said this yet, uh, but if you have a test uh, today, we'll let you know the results within 24 hours. Uh, just make sure that you identify you're one of the ones who is on that list and we'll make sure it happens so you get a call. Even if I have to drive all the samples uh, myself from Barry uh, to the health lab in, uh, in Colchester, we'll get it done in the next 24 hours. That, that's kind of in the vein of what I was going to ask next is somebody who went to this testing site on Friday, they, they went through all the steps yeah. and then this kind of thing happens and their email gets exposed. What would you say to them to try to convince them that this process is still something to be trusted? Yeah, this is, at, you know, this was like adding insult to injury uh, and, uh, and I, I can't justify it. Um, but uh, what I can say is we need, we need to figure, figure out how to get you a test. Uh, let us know how we can make that happen uh, because it's just as important today, probably more important today than it was on Friday. So uh, let us know what we can do to, to assist you uh, in, in getting that test done. And we'll do everything within, uh, I'll do everything within my power. We'll do everything in our power. I know Secretary Smith, Dr. Levine uh, share the same concerns, uh, but we want to get you tested because we want to know uh, whether uh, you should be protecting yourself and your family and others. Um, so this is this is important. Okay, thank you. Cat WCAS. Hi. Talking about testing times here, I'm hearing that some locations, including a hospital, are telling patients that the turnaround time for getting their test results back is four to five days. What can be done to help these locations turn the tests around faster? And what is our average turnaround time right now? Yeah, we've been working on this for quite some time. There was a slowdown with some of the uh, commercial operations, uh, particularly with, I think it was Quest and maybe Broad uh, and maybe another one, but um, but we're trying to rectify that. And I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer that. Thanks, Chad. We met with the hospitals the other day. One of the things that, that um, we talked about was tr trying to um, to move away from those, um, particularly Midwest uh, labs that are that are really under the gun in terms of turnaround times. Uh, sometimes, in the area that you were talking, four to five days and getting getting the results, moving away from uh, those and and moving more towards uh, other labs that are that are quicker and uh, and faster broke for example uh, is is one of those we ha we we really do um, pay attention to uh, the average turnaround time um, given the fact that some of these uh, Midwest labs are four to five days the average turnaround time is 2.4 but it ranges a lot between um, the, the quickest, which is the Department of Health lab, which is one day, uh, Broad is two days, Dartmouth is two days, and then it goes, Rutland is one day, Rutland Medical Regional uh, Center is one day. So we keep tabs on these, but I will say that we have had been encouraging the hospitals to move away from the uh, labs in, in the Midwest. And are COVID tests free? Because I got an email from someone who sent us a picture of their bill for three hundred dollars from a for a test they got at Northwestern Medical Center for COVID nineteen. Should be free. We'll um, if you ask that person to, to send it to Mike Pichek, we'll uh, we'll investigate that. Okay. And then last testing question. I spent about fifteen minutes on the phone this morning with someone who was really frustrated because he said it took him three hours to get a test booked. The hospital wouldn't do it because he was asymptomatic. The health department told him because he has an Android phone and no computer access, he wasn't able to sign up on the health department's registration for any of their tests. Finally got one at an urgent care, and his question was, how do you expect people to get tested if, for some people, it's very difficult to sign up and it takes three hours to finally get your test? Call 211. If, he, if this individual is having problems going online, call 211. They will assist or call the health department. They will assist in making sure um, that this person gets registered. We don't want anybody having difficulty getting registered. Thank you. 
Okay, because uh, he had said he called the health department and they told him that because he had an Android phone, they couldn't register or help him. Okay. So I just kind of want to clarify that people have access yeah. to these yeah. And these, uh, testing sites yeah, they they do, and what you know, I'm I'm a little bit perplexed. I can help this individual if you'd like. Um, and just give me a call. But um, we have set up multiple ways that you can register. Um, obviously, online is probably the easiest for most people. But in this case, it sounds like this individual was having a tough time. So we do have other ways that you can register. Two one one. You can call the 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 call center at the health department. I'm a little perplexed why it was said that way, but I'll, I'll check on that. Thank you. Yep. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, the, uh, obviously the Vermont State College is vital to the economy in many different ways. And as, as you well know, Northern Vermont University got a 3.5 million extraordinary gift that was announced yesterday. Is, I know they're not out of the woods in their budget, but from your perspective, does that change the math at all and whether, you know, having to further consolidate or cut back on the state colleges? No, I mean, because that's a one-time gift, and they have um, serious challenges in terms of this being ongoing uh, in terms of their budget. So um, one-time money doesn't fix it. I think they're going to have to look for uh, other ways uh, to increase either increase revenue on a consistent basis and that usually means uh, bringing more students in um, because that's what they're they're losing out on uh, the number of students the income the customers so to speak uh, into the their portfolio um, or you have to reduce costs uh, and that's the only way you're going to get back in the uh, in the, in the black uh, because they're they're obviously in the red would you support uh, further consolidation? I'm, I'm supportive of any idea they might have, uh, and we will consider this uh, to get them back in the black um, because they can't go on like this. And Vermont just doesn't have the resources to, to continue to provide uh, bridge funding. Yeah, great, thank you. John, BPR. Lisa, thank you for the question. We try to keep um, um, testing outside of the schools primarily because we do not want to introduce um, any COVID cases within the schools. So we try to keep them outside the schools. And in fact, we try to keep uh, our testing capabilities outside sort of traveled areas um, that would have a lot of foot traffic that wouldn't normally be there. So, um, so that's that's the reason for that's the answer to your question. Thank you for that. And then a quick follow up. Um, I've also had readers in the community reach out and want to know if they can volunteer to help as contact tracers. Um, yes, uh, there is a course that you have to go through, but um, we you can reach out. Um, I will have somebody contact you, Lisa, because um, uh, I would appreciate that, frankly. Great. And one final quick follow-up, if um, Secretary French is on the line. Was there supposed to be a school sports update today, a winter sports update? Um, Lisa, I can probably answer that. Uh, we, we talked about this on Friday 
and we said we would give a weekly update. Uh, so we'll be giving an, an update on Friday in terms of winter sports. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. Stewart, NBC5. Hi there. Um, there was a report out last night about the majority of states miscalculating unemployment benefits and uh, the federal government was going to require that states move heaven and earth to uh, retroactively catch up. Is Vermont impacted by this? Yeah, I don't believe so, but I'm going to ask Commissioner Harrington to weigh in. Uh, thanks, Governor, and, and thank you for the question. Uh, there were two parts in the article that I saw that um, probably will pose, uh, you know, uh, spark a question. One was the PUA benefits and people um, or different states underpaying benefits. A lot of that, um, uh, what we're hearing from states is that um, individuals were getting the minimum amount that go into the PUA program. When you initially filed, you could get the minimum amount. When you were able to validate um, through your tax filing for 2019 what your uh, earned income was, your your benefit amount could then be adjusted um, upwards from the minimum if you qualified um, for a different amount. Vermont didn't run into this issue uh, because from the beginning of the program, we built in the functionality. So if someone uploads their tax information, um, the system will will recalculate um, the benefit based on um, the earnings. Uh, and so um, some states, because of the backlog and delay in processing of some claims, have, it sounded like, had not um, caught up and made all those adjustments, but uh, our system uh, was designed that way to make that adjustment. Someone, was, someone is, when they come in the system, based on what they report on their own and their earnings, it calculates um, what their uh, weekly benefit amount is. However, it will only pay them the minimum amount until they upload the documentation. Um, so once they've done that, it'll uh, it'll pay out the, the full weekly benefit amount. The other part of the article, which you know is probably worth mentioning, um, was around PUA data reporting. Uh, and um, at least for some time now, uh, we've been reporting consistently our PUA filing data to the federal government, but all states uh, found themselves in this issue of a delayed reporting um, because the program started, but the, the reporting mechanisms were not all in place. And it sounds like based on the article, some states are having um, trouble reporting uh, PUA filing data on a consistent basis to the federal yeah. government. But uh, we've been reporting that for some time now. Okay, uh, and a, a question please for Commissioner Pichak uh, regarding mobility. I think you've talked about this some weeks back, but it's pretty interesting how you know that travel in and out was down by specific percentages. Can you, is this through uh, cell phone tracking or how can you, how do you know that? Yeah, so good question, Stuart. So again, the, the information is um, provided by third party providers. It's, you know, available um, through Google and others. We happen to have a contract with an outfit called SafeGraph, which is providing this information free to governments and academic institutions during the pandemic. So it's very useful information for us. You have to have the power to be able to analyze it and understand what's in there, but it's a very valuable um, uh, use for us. So the information is aggregated. So it's not, you know, any individual information is aggregated at the census block region. It's, it's anonymized. So we don't know who it is. We don't know where they're coming from in terms of their street or their house or even their town. It's again at the census level. Um, and then it's user consented. So people um, agree to have their location followed on whatever apps they might have on their phone. Uh, so from that, we can you know, look at the amount of, of travel, the amount of cell phone variation that occurred, whether someone spent um, a lot of time at the office in one week and then that cell phone doesn't show up in the office the next week. It gives you that amount of, of variation uh, in terms of where people are spending their time and, and how the mobility is moving. But again, it's, it's anonymized, it's aggregated, and it's user consented. And can you ballpark how many phones you're tracking to come up with the numbers you gave us earlier? Yeah, so just to, just to clarify, like, you know, it's certainly not tracking, it's just, it's sort of 
data that's provided by this third party provider and in many ways available not just to us but to the public at large um, but uh, the amount of you know the amount of uh, you know somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of people agree to have their location tracked or have the or have the apps downloaded on their phone to have their location tracked so if you aggregate that out across the country you know it's a pretty large percentage of cell phones and then you can do some statistical analysis to make um, a determination about how many people that represents thank you thank you both Aaron BT Digger Aaron BT Digger I I understand that the um, you know lower in case numbers are a little preliminary especially during um, you know the long weekend but what level or what degree of fall in cases would make you consider reopening the spigot in terms of some of these restrictions, um, like the uh, full-time household gathering rule, for example? Yeah, tough to put a number on that, Aaron. Uh, a lot of factors go into that, uh, but uh, but certainly what we're seeing now leveling out, we'd like to see a decrease, um, but. But really, uh, we need to see that decrease over the next two weeks um, because uh, that's how long it's going to take for us to, to see that ripple effect of Thanksgiving and then make a determination from there. So uh, we'll continue to analyze the, the data again. Good news at this point in time, but, but, but we'll, you know, time will tell whether that holds. And we certainly don't want to, even if we, let's just say, uh, we leveled out uh, and we were leveled out at 80 cases uh, a day or something, it, didn't, it wasn't increasing. Uh, that's not a good place to start out on uh, in anticipation of the next holiday. So uh, again, we weigh a lot of factors in making these decisions. Uh, and I think uh, it's, it seems as though uh, Vermonters understood uh, why this was important and followed suit. And I hope, uh, I hope we continue to see a drop so that we can, uh, um, you know, change uh, some of the restrictions um, so that uh, we can go back to some sort of normal but but again you know I, I'm reluctant to say at this point uh, what we do until we till we get there does the evidence or, or or outcome of Thanksgiving at all affect your decision whether or not to keep that gathering restriction in place for Christmas absolutely All right, that's it. Thank you. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Uh, Governor, the dashboard shows right now that 59 of Vermont's 72 deaths are, were from individuals 70 or older. Once the over 70 population is sufficiently vaccinated, will you continue your work, social gathering, educational and travel restrictions? And if so, why uh, if the risk to the most threatened demographic has been greatly mitigated? Yeah, no, I think you bring up a good point. Uh, and what we're hoping, Guy, is that we can start to uh, reduce the restrictions as time goes on, as more people get vaccinated. But, uh, but we'd have to see, um, first of all, we'd have to, first of all, we have to have the vaccine. Uh, that hasn't been um, okayed uh, by the uh, by the FDA at this point in time, um, and then we're going to have to have a quantity uh, of, uh, of vaccines uh, that we can distribute wide enough so it would have some effect. So there's a lot of ifs there, uh, but uh, but at the same time we would look at that and and hopefully if we were able to. And again, Dr. Levine is probably much more appropriate to answer this question, um, but. But if we could, if we could uh, get to the population that are the most vulnerable, uh, then maybe some of the restrictions on visitation and long-term care facilities could be relaxed in some way. And that uh, nothing could make me happier uh, than that uh, to, to try and give some relief uh, to those who are in those facilities. Thank you. Uh, question uh, for either you or Commissioner Shirley. Uh, proposed modernization of policing 
uh, seems as much concentration, as I read them, as much concentration of policing authority as it is on modernization of policing methods. Uh, for example, new hiring and promotion systems uh, in all law enforcement agencies statewide, statewide police dispatch and data computer systems, standard and mandatory for all agencies. Why does policing modernization also need concentration of uh, authority and systems at the state level? Uh, that's definitely a Commissioner Sherling question. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the question and uh, for highlighting this important work. Um, a number of the things that, that you've noted are areas where we've been in ongoing conversation with uh, the legislature and uh, if you read the, the nuanced details of that plan, um, much of the foundation for these conversations actually goes back as far as uh, in 2021, it'll be 51 years of studies and reports that talk about the best way to deliver safety services. Um, but as important as those historic studies, we've reached a point uh, not only in Vermont, but nationally, where disparity of operation, whether it's in data reporting and gathering or um, in certain kinds of really high profile policies like uh, use of force, uh, body worn cameras, things like that, that having disparity across agencies is just not the way the public expects things to function. So, whether that's the roughly 80 agencies in Vermont or the roughly 18,000 across the country. Uh, the expectation is that there's going to be more uniformity and approach uh, with the key areas of operation and that's one of the reasons that uh, the modernization strategy is in part framed with those components you, you see the the general public is actually requesting this do you have any any data on that Again, we have uh, literally 50 years of studies. There are 23 of them that talk about uh, regionalizing services and combining efforts, and they all essentially say the same thing, that uh, duplicating and having that kind of variation is not the way uh, to run these kinds of, of operations. Thank you. I, I may want to go back. Uh, Dr. Kelso, was there anything that you wanted to add to the previous question? No, Governor, I think you did an excellent job. Um, I'll expand a little bit. Um, I think, as you said, there's not one measure, but certainly our goal is to get enough of the population vaccinated that we can start to pull back on some of the restrictions. Um, it's also, though, going to depend on what else is happening among Vermonters who are not yet vaccinated and whether we're seeing um, high rates of disease or hospitalization among you know, the unvaccinated folks. Um, but certainly as we vaccinate more, um, we get closer and closer to easing up. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Steve from NEK TV. Uh, hello, can you hear me? You can. Um, Thanks. Uh, I, I guess I had one for Mike Smith and one for the governor. Um, uh, concerning the testing, Mike, uh, uh, you, you inferred that the uh, that the the tests were somehow like connected to people's e uh, emails. Um, is there no privacy involved? I thought that uh, folks were given like a number. So that you know uh, their DNA wouldn't be like uh, taken without a warrant. Steve, there was supposed to be privacy. I don't know what happened in this case. Like I said, we're still um, trying to figure out what went wrong in this particular case. So um, it, I, I don't have an answer for you, um, but obviously something went uh, wrong in this case, and we need to um, we need to fix it. So for the majority of tests, though, it, 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 you can guarantee anonymity? Yeah, for the majority of tests, I, uh, I, I feel very comfortable. I mean, we've done tens of thousands of tests uh, and never had a problem. And, and this is a, I'm hoping this is an outlier. 
Matter of fact, this is an outlier, Steve. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, uh, thank you. Um, Governor, um, uh, the, uh, the folks that died last week, I guess their ages were um, 76, 81, and 94. Um, and uh, when, when all this is said and done, and maybe over, hopefully, uh, next spring or, or whatever, uh, will you be planning on having like uh, memorial services for those uh, for those lives who were tragically cut short at uh, age 94 or 81? Yeah, you know, we don't want to forget that. I know we talked about this at uh, one of the previous uh, press conferences uh, where Mary Kate Brown uh, lost her life and her family reached out and said uh, we wanted to make sure that everyone understood that their mom wasn't just a number. Uh, she was a person uh, that had a full life and, uh, and gave back uh, to her community. So we, uh, on the 19th, as you know, have every month, uh, we do lower uh, the flags to have staff uh, to memorialize those we have lost and we'll continue uh, to do that until this is over. And then uh, I think you're right. I, I want to, uh, to make sure that we reflect on those uh, who, who we lost and, um, and then focus again on those we've saved uh, with some of the measures we've taken. So, um, but I don't want to forget uh, about those um, who were impacted greatly. Well, can't that be, can't the same be said about every life governor um, for, for every death? Well, I think this, uh, in this instance with a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic, uh, when you have a quarter million lives lost, over a quarter million lives lost across the country, um, I think uh, this, uh, again, every life is important, uh, but this one is a, a pandemic where you know, once in a century, hopefully once in a century pandemic we're living through right now. Uh, we've been in a state of emergency since since March, and uh, and hopefully we see light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think this you know rises up uh, to a certain level uh, with every uh, crisis that we face. So uh, I'm not sure what uh, what you're getting at, Steve, but but I think that this is a this is a different case. Well, I mean, I, 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 mean, I don't know how many I don't know how many pandemics you've been through, uh, but this is the first for me. The third in my lifetime, but the, uh, but I mean, would you support in in order for something like this to not happen again? And we were warned by the bioethicists when they started, uh, you know, doing these gain of function research um, that something like this could get loose. And something like this might happen um, with SARS and MERS. We already knew where the stuff came from, you know, within a relatively short time frame. But with this one, we still don't seem to know. We don't, uh, they haven't proven that it's zoonotic or anything. I'm Dr. Levine should be here for this one. But uh, would you support, would you support a letter, uh, you know, to bioethicists uh, so that they, do, we don't support this gain of function research that, that it could lead to stuff like this happening in the future I think, again? You know, I think Dr. Levine has uh, talked about this a lot. Uh, and I think it is important for us to pay attention to science, uh, you know, as we move forward, fund uh, some of these, uh, uh, the, the science-based organizations uh, so that we don't get in the same position we're in today. But, but I think he is a better one to answer this. But obviously, uh, we will have to uh, reflect on this as a, as a country, uh, as, as, as the world, um, and, and make sure that we don't have to go through this again. I mean, it's crippled. Our economy has crippled our health, and uh, and we need to do better. All right, we're going to move on. Yeah, to sometimes the, the biggest wounds are self-inflicted. Thank you. Yeah. We move to Andrew Caledonian Record. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, my questions are about the Irish Spirit Church alert. Uh, so I'm not sure if I should wait for Dr. Levine to return, or if perhaps Secretary Smith or Dr. Kelso want to take a swing at him. Maybe, maybe you give us a try. If we, if not, we'll uh, we'll defer to Dr. Levine and wait for him to come back. Maybe he won't come okay. back if he um, if you ask the question though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, understood. Uh, well, I'm assuming uh, that you 
you folks have heard uh, the pastor's concerns that the alert may have been based on inaccurate information. Um, uh, so I guess I'm looking for some of the details. Uh, you know, can you confirm that the alert was, is was and is accurate, and provide any details about uh, the individual that was tested in terms of when the test was conducted, when the results came in, when they were contacted, things of that nature. I I think that probably is a, a better question for Dr. Levine, um, but we feel confident in the approach we took and our reaction in the contact tracing. Um, uh, well, I'll certainly await his return. Uh, I, I do have, though, a question about the, the expectations for churches operating um, and the guidance that, the, that they need to follow. Does anyone know whether the Irisburg Church was abiding by those uh, expectations? Um, and if it's found in this case or in any other case that, that the church um, especially isn't uh, following the guidance of their consequences, yeah. Not doing so. yeah, I think uh, religious uh, services are exempt uh, from a lot of uh, some of the restrictions we put in into place. But uh, but I'll ask maybe either Secretary Curley or Dr. Kelso if maybe you can give us a little more information. Um, I'll defer to Dr. Kelso uh, maybe knowing more about uh, the situation in particular. But as far as the uh, District setting, um, Governor, you're right. We do have a, um, some limitations on the occupancy, the capacity um, currently, but no maximum um, cap on that. But again, that guidance is on our website if anybody wants to check it out. But I would defer to Dr. Castle in terms of specifics to that particular, um, that particular search and, and the guidance. Okay. I, I, I honestly, Thanks. I honestly don't have any information myself about what this church's practices were, um, but I can reiterate what the governor said in that we are confident in the information that was obtained by the contact tracing and EPI team um, that prompted the alert that we sent out. Okay. Um, well, I uh, will reserve, I guess, an opportunity to chat with Dr. Levine when he returns. Thanks. Thank you. Avery, WCAX. Hello. I have a question from a viewer that was sent to us. Uh, they uh, obviously it's the holiday season and caroling is a big, big thing. And they were wondering about going caroling to people who may be inside their homes, the elderly, and whether it would be safe to do so if they traveled in family ties and stayed more than six feet apart while doing this. Um. That would, from my standpoint, um, and again, I might uh, refer to others, but uh, that would be, you know, mixing different families together and congregating, uh, and uh, that wouldn't be a good idea. Uh, but I'm not sure if um, if there was a family who was singing outside the home um, from a distance away, uh, that uh, and they were all part of one family. I'm I'm not sure that that would. Uh, that wouldn't be okay, um, but uh, I might refer, I don't know, uh, Secretary Smith, you want to try this? And I'll maybe rely on others to bail me out if I'm wrong on this, but it, I think the governor is absolutely right. If it's a multi-family going around Carolyn, and, and remember, Singing is, uh, without a mask, singing is not um, the, the best um, way to protect oneself. Uh, we saw a church in the state of Washington um, have a, a high infection rate from a choir practice that, that happened. But if you're a single fam if you're a family, if you're a household, um, I don't see an issue with it. As long as you're outside, I would caution um, because of people being so vulnerable at an at an age over 65 to this virus, to be very, very cautious uh, approaching someone that is in that age group uh, in terms of caroling. So, um, you know, single household, uh, mask, you know, all the requirements that you have outside and at a great distance, 
I think we you should be okay. Um, but remember who's in the house as well. Okay. Um, and just a quick question that's not related, but Carolyn Dokovic. Um, there is a report that came out that said that some states are considering allowing optometrists and dentists to also give out the vaccine when it becomes available. Obviously, there's a lot of unknowns with the vaccine right now, but is that something Vermont has discussed? Um, not that I'm aware of, um, but we do have a vaccine team uh, and we can get you that answer, but, um, but not that I know of at this point in time. Thank you. Pam Davis of Vermont Journal. Pam, I know you're want, you want to talk to Dr. Levine, but... Mm -hmm. Joel had a sticky button last time. Yeah, and we've had a few sticky buttons today. Mm -hmm. um, we'll run back through some folks at the end. Tom, the Vermont Standard. Tom. All right, we'll try Joel Lee, Local 22. I'm wondering if we have a problem. Yes, we have had some issues today with team. Um, let's see. I think I will go back to Joe from the Barton Chronicle. John Dillon, VPR. Maybe I'll just ask anyone who can get through to jump in with their follow-up question. Go ahead. Hi, Rebecca. This is Greg from the County Courier. Hey, Greg. So I was waiting because Dr. Levine is not back, and I believe your questions are for him. Uh, potentially. Uh, this one may uh, be for Secretary Smith. Um, obviously, with the loss of tests in Barry, uh, many people have experienced some, some financial loss, whether it be the state with their testing materials, people with their time off from work. Uh, was this UPS package insured, and, and if so, would the state be trying to recover some of their expenses for the, the testing? Yeah, I'll let uh, Secretary Smith answer, but again, we're, we're just assessing the situation in real time now, and we'll be contemplating all of those uh, questions you might have in regards to who, what, where, when, and how, and uh, then come to some determination as to what we do from there. But uh, Secretary Smith. Greg, the uh, governor said it right. I don't have an answer to that question right at the moment. Uh, I expect that I will get an answer to that question, but I don't have it right now. Okay. And, uh, the other one I had related to Barry was, uh, you know, people that were getting a test because they traveled, they already waited seven days to, to get a test on Friday. Uh, people rescheduling today, they're going to try to get in tomorrow. Uh, I believe you said two and a half days is average to get their results. So they're getting it on Friday. What, what's the uh, motivating factor for people who don't get retested? Well, the motivating factor is we're going to expedite their, their tests. The governor had made it clear that we are going to expedite their tests. So we will expedite the tests of those people, those those 200 plus people that uh, took their test on Friday. Uh, 
sure that they got to wait at seven days for Thanksgiving. Yeah. yeah. And, and we don't know in terms of why they're taking a test at this point. Okay. Um, I had a clarifying question for the governor. Uh, a question earlier about people that wanted to travel to the state. I think it was specifically about snowmobiles. Um, but did I understand you correctly that if somebody wants to travel to the state, they cannot quarantine for 14 days and then come to Vermont? They must do their quarantine in the state of Vermont? That's my understanding, yes. Because if you quarantine in another state, you still have to get here. So we want to get you inside the bubble. So if, if someone were to be in Plattsburgh, uh, for instance, quarantined in their house for 14 days, got in their car and traveled here, they're, I know they're not in their bubble here for that 14 days, but they're still within a bubble where they shouldn't be getting it. Well, I, I let's, just, let's just say, I mean, if we, if we start yeah. opening it up like that, uh, someone flying in from Fort Lauderdale uh, into Vermont, they quarantine at home, uh, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't give us a lot of comfort. And if they quarantine yeah. in Boston and drive up and stop in Manchester uh, to get gas, um, that doesn't give us much comfort either. So from my standpoint, getting them here in the bubble and then quarantining is the best policy. Um, feel free, okay. maybe Secretary right. Curley um, or others uh, who want to weigh in can, if I've got that wrong. Uh, Chair, I just wanted to clarify that the state of Vermont or quarantine in their home for seven days and get a negative test, but we, you know, wait it out in their home other than when they go out to get the test, they get a negative test. In both cases, if they drive directly to Vermont, um, we do allow that. So um, I would support you, Governor, that, you know, right now, in light of the situation, the way things are, it's probably the best policy would be for people to come to Vermont to carry out their quarantine. Um, but we do permit uh, folks to quarantine at home in another state as long as they are making a direct trip in a private vehicle. So no commercial travel in. Okay. News to me, but uh, okay. that makes sense. Does that help, Craig? Okay. That, that, yes, that's, that's what I thought it was. And I was a little confused when, when it sounds like it was something different. Um, uh, I did have a couple other follow-up questions, but I don't know if other people are able to get back on. Yeah, there are a few others that have let me know they're still waiting for their to be reacted, right? Okay. But, but let me ask one more, and, and I hope this isn't for Dr. Levine. If there's questions, if there's time after, I might get one more. But uh, there seems to be a, a, at least a general common denominator with many of the elderly care facilities being that they're operated by Genesis. Is the state looking into any operational policies and making sure that there isn't a problem there? Secretary Smith. As you know, Greg, those facilities, whether they're Genesis or other facilities, those skilled nursing facilities are governed under the rules of uh, CMS, which is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid or Medicaid and Medicare uh, services. Um, it, those are inspected on a regular basis. Um, I don't know the, the specific facility that you're talking about, um, but certainly we can find out what the latest inspection results were of, of any facility that uh, you may you may like, and I can I can have Connor get back to you on that one. Okay. Well, I, I was just noticing that the initial outbreak in, in you know the first nursing home in Burlington, then the one in Rutland. Uh, now when we all them, but I think at least those three are operated by Genesis. They seem to have a fairly large outbreak, so I didn't know if there was uh, any anything at the state level that people were looking at um, that, that maybe there's a bigger issue here. Yeah, not, not to my knowledge at this time. Okay, thank you, Secretary. I'll hold off here. All right, Jolie, Local 22. Oh, 
Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, great. Um, I have a question from a viewer uh, who tried to contact the health department uh, related to the results of the Burlington Miller Center, uh, a pop-up testing site a couple weeks ago. Uh, the testing was used to see if there was a correlation between COVID-19 and wastewater at North Avenue uh, treatment plant, and if the positive test from the new North End um, residents uh, related to that, and um, they wanted to know um, where they could find the results. They weren't seeing it on the Department of Health website. I, th I think those are being done locally, unless someone can correct me. I know when Burlington did theirs, it was done on the local level, and I'm wondering if uh, Essex is doing the same on the local level. So you might want to call your uh, local administrator uh, or town manager uh, to get the results from that. Okay. Um, and then my second question, um, just with um, the uncertainty uh, that we're seeing in the, in the coming weeks, um, do you think that uh, Thanksgiving guidance could or should have gone into effect earlier on? No, I think it was the appropriate time, obviously. I mean, we, we're we seeing the results of uh, Halloween uh, two weeks after, three weeks after, after uh, towards uh, Thanksgiving. So uh, Thanksgiving wasn't the problem. Uh, Halloween was the problem. And we tried to give everyone fair warning and give guidelines as to what we should be doing and not doing. Uh, and then we had to take uh, further action and after we saw the outbreaks there. So I don't think that that would have done a lot of good unless we could have, I mean, could have, would have, should have, um, maybe uh, putting those restrictions in place before uh, Halloween. But this really took us uh, by surprise in some respects uh, in, uh, in the, um, the trajectory uh, that, uh, that we found ourselves on as a result of uh, Halloween. Anything, Commissioner Pichek, you want to add to that? I think, we, I think we talked about Thanksgiving for weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talked about Thanksgiving for weeks before. In fact, uh, Commissioner Pichek's uh, data showing uh, the Canadian Thanksgiving, I think, uh, gave us fair warning as to what might happen. Thank you so much. All right, I'm going to try to just go through those folks that have been having trouble one more time. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. John Dillon, BPR. Joel, the Burlington Free Press. Tom, the Vermont Standard. Is there, is there anyone on the line at this point uh, who might have a question that isn't for Dr. Levine that might want to ask? Uh, Governor, this is Greg from the Cur County Courier. I, I do have two follow-up questions that are, that are not for them. Go ahead. Uh, I believe this one's for Secretary Trench. Uh, with more and more cases popping up uh, related to schools, um, we're, we're hearing that some schools are not asking about social gatherings in their daily questionnaire. Uh, other schools are essentially outsourcing the questions to parents and just uh, asking the, that the parents ask their students every day uh, about their, their safety questions. Um, how much oversight does the Department of Education actually have to ensure that these screening questions are being asked uh, every day and, and uh, being answered honestly and properly? Secretary French. Can we have to hit star six, Secretary French? Uh, 
but we do have the doctor back in the house, so. Hello? Go ahead. Um, oh, sorry. Can you hear me, Governor? Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah, uh, you know, just the beginning of the question, um, I'm not quite sure that the cases are increasing in schools per se. I think we've seen a pretty consistent number. Um, in terms of you know, implementing the guidance and uh, the question, uh, yesterday was our essentially our first day of operationalizing that, so I think it's a little early uh, to tell. But uh, we have, been, have not been um, really checking in with districts to, to how uh, the daily questionnaire piece has been going. Um, our impression is that this has been going fairly well. Um, I do have regular contact with the superintendents, and you know, once again, it is a uh, it's just one aspect of uh, multiple layers of our uh, mitigation strategy that we employ in schools. So all together, I think we can say they're working well because we we haven't really seen any spread of the virus inside the school. Um, so I think it's a little early to assess uh, the impact of a group gathering uh, question on schools and how they're doing with it. Um, since yesterday was the first day, essentially, that they operate from last week. How about the uh, districts that are essentially outsourcing the, the questionnaires to parents and, and hoping hoping that the parents are, are actually doing it on a daily basis? Yeah, I mean, that, that is the sort of the fault anyway for particularly for the younger students parents are asked to take those questionnaires on behalf of students so i wouldn't necessarily agree it's outsourcing per se it's just, it's actually how it's designed to do uh it's designed and how it's supposed to work we ask parents to put tests on behalf of their students uh, certainly i know there's many districts particularly with the older students the students themselves provide that attestation on a daily basis um, but that, you know, that it all comes back to trust, and once again, it's just one aspect of our mitigation strategies, and uh, that's why we, you know, we try to develop policy guidance, uh, operationalize that at the local level, because that's where that trust plays out. So, you know, once again, the, the order requires everyone to do uh, their best and, uh, to comply uh, with that. Um, it's been challenging, uh, you know, but um, all in all, I think we're seeing a high degree of compliance on behalf of Vermonters. Okay, and then uh, my only other follow-up was probably for Commissioner Schilling, uh, an update on the BSP there with Ben Alden having a possibly an outbreak. Yeah, thanks for uh, the follow-up question. Um, we've been uh, a little lucky that uh, we've got one additional positive across all of the tests that were conducted. So a total of two positives, uh, and we'll continue to monitor uh, that situation to make sure it doesn't involve further. Thank you. That's, that's it for me, and I appreciate the extra time. I know with the update of your cases, people are really wanting to know a lot more. Thank you. All okay. right. Since we have, are having issues, I did get a text question from John Dillon from VPR wondering when is the earliest we could see vaccines for healthcare workers? Is that you, Dr. Levine? Dr. Levine is back as well. Your um, my, my sense from current information, but this changes literally every day or every other day, is close to the 20th of December, maybe the 19th. Uh, I don't want anybody to hang their head on that date, but preliminarily that's what we have. And that would be enough doses for a portion of the healthcare workforce. Mike Donahue had a question for Dr. Levine. If Mike wants to go. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Dr. Levine, I was just wondering uh, why you were not uh, more candid with the uh, medical patients when you sent out that email last night explaining what exactly happened. I mean, Secretary Smith was pretty upfront to tell them what happened. Why, why didn't you tell the people involved in either of your emails what specifically happened? Well, I guess I would disagree with you about the content, but what I can say is um, 
The concerns of the staff very originally were to make sure people who had thought they were going to get a test result in the mail got notification that they actually weren't going to get a test result and to allow them to avail themselves of other testing opportunities. And the uh, intent of the second email was really because of the concern that we knew people would have regarding uh, confidential medical information being available to others that indeed, yes, email addresses were um, available, but the um, contents of anyone's medical information was not available, so it was to be reassured. And if I could just piggyback on the Secretary's earlier comments, um, uh, he, he provided appropriately uh, uh, a number of apologies, and uh, since he is the Secretary of the agency, um, that could be an uh, overarching apology, but I want to make sure that from the Department of Health, you also hear that there is a sincere apology for both issues, the issue of the tests never being performed because of the sample issue and because of the uh, way the email went out. Well, the, your, your own words that due to circumstances beyond our control with transporting your COVID test taken on November 27th, Barry, the laboratory was unable to process your results. That doesn't really say what Secretary Smith who was pretty candid about what exactly happened. Correct. Obviously, it, that's it. Well, th yes, and, and not all of the knowledge was present at the time that the first email went out either. The goal of the first email was to let people know they weren't going to get a result and allow them to know where they could go to get tested again. And maybe you could answer one, Secretary Smith, I'd ask him, what, what about the person who uh, didn't have, was signed up to test on Friday, didn't go, went on Saturday, and then still got an email? How's your record keeping? I guess I'm not understanding your question. Uh, the person signed up to be tested on Friday, did not go, instead went on Saturday, and then ended up getting an email telling that their test from Friday had been destroyed or was no longer valid or good, and they wouldn't be getting a test from their Friday test, when in fact this person never had a test on Friday. But you were sending emails. so. Are there really 224 tests that got destroyed, or that's just a guess on your part? Uh, there are no guesses here. Uh, we're, we're dealing with people's results. We know what tests were sent to the lab and what tests were not processed by the lab. So those people have been appropriately notified. But again, one person said she got an email saying her test was destroyed, yeah. and she never took I, the I'd love, I'd love for you to forward me that information, and we'll look into it and respond back. Okay. And I believe uh, Andrew from the Caledonian Record had a follow-up for Dr. Levine regarding our uh, Yes, thank you. I'm still here. Um, uh, Dr. Levine, uh, I'm sure you're aware of um, the, the Iris Bird alert that went out and the uh, pastor's concerns about whether that alert was accurate or not. Um, I'm wondering if you can, uh, one, confirm uh, that all of the details uh, that, you, that were provided in the alert are still accurate to the best of the health department's knowledge, and what kind of assurances do you offer to the community that it is so and, and do you have any ongoing concerns about what this confusion may result? Yeah, so thank you. I, I, in my uh, original comments today, I did talk, um, without being specific, about Irisburg, about why and when we send out communications to the community at large. Um, we feel very comfortable because we've had multiple people uh, interacting with the uh, church and with the uh, community that uh, we are well aware of uh, who has a positive test. We're well aware of um, wh what lists do to, did or did not exist uh, at the, at the uh, House of Worship regarding uh, parishioners on a certain date. Um, and we're well aware of exactly uh, what 
information was not transmitted to the greater community uh, in a timely fashion. So all of those factors went into our desire to then provide information to the public so that if they happen to be present at a time of risk, they could take care of themselves and their loved ones who might be vulnerable loved ones uh, and do the right thing at the right time. Uh, so, you know, and plus it was an educational effort as well. So we feel that, you know, protecting the public's health um, was very critical here and needed to be done in a timely way. So there, uh, there's nothing about the, uh, the claims that the pastor has been making um, public and sharing with his membership that, uh, that there was no positive test and, and the person in question wasn't even present on that Sunday, November 22nd. Uh, that, yeah. that is um, contrary to your understanding of the situation in its entirety. Both of those are contrary to my understanding in its entirety, yes. So your advice then to, uh, to the membership of the church at this point is the same as what was in the alert. It was uh, to, to strongly consider getting tested as soon as possible. Or, and or to uh, appropriately uh, quarantine if they felt that they had uh, contact on the date that was listed uh, at the time listed because that would be of concern. And, and when you say contact, I mean, it's, I don't, to my knowledge, the, the positive case identity is not known in the general public at this point. Um, Correct. When you say contact, do you mean just being in attendance at that service? Or Correct. is there something more specific when you say contact? No, just being in attendance at that service. And is, uh, are, are there any further considerations going on at this point um, in terms of, you know, should, should the church still be holding services? Are there, are there operational changes that the health department would like to see um, made? Yeah, there's no reason for the church to not be holding services based on uh, this public health information. Uh, we would like to see the church abide by the ACCD uh, guidance regarding uh, places of worship uh, during the COVID pandemic. Which, uh, which details of that guidance do, uh, are you looking for? Uh, making sure there's a list of people to connect with uh, so that one's aware of who's attendance at, on a certain date so that for contact tracing purposes, people can be connected with uh, as rapidly and efficaciously as possible. Okay, I appreciate the time to circle back with more questions. That's it for me. Okay, it looks like Joel from the Burlington Free Press is currently unmuted. So I will try you one last time and then I'm going to just determine we have a technology issue with the I'm unmuted, did you say? Go ahead, Joel. <laughs> wow, I had no idea. Um, no, I, I don't have any questions I, uh, at this point. Thanks. I, uh, I think you've covered it all, uh, the you. questions that I had. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Joel. I think that's it. And we will put the folks that couldn't get through today at the top of the queue on Friday. Sorry about this. OK. Um, well, thank you all again for tuning in. And we'll see you again on Friday. Uh,